Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Father in heaven, if you were to number our sins, we could not count them and we could not stand before you, but there is forgiveness with you that we would fear you and know you. Lord, as we come to this time where we remember your son, I, I pray that you would grant us your grace, that we would understand your word, we would see your son with clarity for who he is, and I pray it in his name. Amen. All right, well, now we come to the time in our service where we are going to remember Christ around his table. This is a time for Christians to remember Jesus and what he did in their place at the cross, all that he did for them. Uh, in a minute, we're going to be taking some, a little bit of bread, a wafer, and a bit of juice. And these are symbols of the blood and the body of Christ that were offered at the cross for all of those who would put their trust and their confidence in the Lord. And today, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at a passage where Jesus points to his miracles as means of affirming his identity as the Savior. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to Matthew chapter 11? We're going to be looking at verses 2 through 6 together. Some men are coming down the aisles, and if you don't have a Bible, simply raise your hand. We'll get one to you. And if you don't own a Bible, please keep this Bible for yourself so that you can begin reading God's Word for yourself. Setting here in Matthew chapters 10 and 11 is that Jesus has just sent out his disciples. This is their first preaching mission on their own. Jesus has sent them out and he is remaining in the Galilean region and he's preaching in the cities. And Jesus' message, the message that he is preaching is a message that has many competitors. There are many competitors in the region and many questions are raising as to whether or not he truly is the savior. As we read our passage, notice the question that is asked by those that represent John the Baptist, and then notice the response of Jesus to that question. Reading Matthew 11, verses 2 through 6. Now, when John in prison heard the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for someone else? And Jesus answered and said to him, Go and report to John what you hear, and what you see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Now again, there were many messages in New Testament Israel at this time. There were messages from the Pharisees and the Sadducees. There were messages that were believed by the Hellenistic Jews and there was the true gospel that Jesus himself was teaching. So how was a person to know which one of these messages he was supposed to believe? How was John really supposed to know? Are you the one who is to come? How is he supposed to know this? Well, at this time we had no New Testament canon. The New Testament canon was empty. So we didn't really have any standard against which to compare a message. Today, we can do that. When we hear a message, we can open our Bibles, we can open our New Testament, and we can read them, and we can see for ourselves God's design for salvation. And we can compare that message that we hear to the truth of the gospel. In Jesus' time, while he was teaching, we did not have our New Testaments yet. But in the absence of the New Testament scriptures, God gave us clear guidance on how to do that. And the guidance is this, a supernatural message is accompanied by supernatural signs. In the New Testament era, the supernatural message accompanied by supernatural signs. Turn back to one chapter to chapter 10. Read verse 1. Summoning his 12 disciples, Jesus gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. So Jesus has this authority and he confers this authority onto his disciples for the purpose of casting out unclean spirits and over diseases and sicknesses. And this is for the purpose of attesting to the genuineness of their message. That's the primary purpose of this authority that Jesus gave them. So that people could hear this message and they could see the signs and they could know that those signs affirm and attest the message as the one true message. So when John, back in verse 3 in our passage, says, Are you the one who is to come? Jesus is ready with the answer. 
Look at the five signs that he points to in verse 5. The blind receive sight. The lame are walking. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf are hearing and the dead are raised up. These are all supernatural miracles that Jesus performed. These are signs which he gave them. And these signs don't stand on their own. The message is no good if you don't have a sign to affirm it. But on the other hand, there's no purpose for affirmation if you don't have a message itself. So the message and the signs, they go together. They stand together. But then we see what that message is. And Jesus addresses that at the very end of verse 5. He says, the poor have the gospel preached to them. So the gospel is the message that Jesus is preaching. And it's being preached by the one who performs these signs. That is how we know that this is the one true message. And then Jesus finishes by saying, blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Jesus is not talking about somebody being personally offended. What he's talking about here is someone who is stumbling into sin and remaining in sin over Jesus himself. Jesus is saying, I am the savior and my message of salvation through faith in me is the truth. That is the message and my miracles prove it to you. And the message again is the message that, of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, that he is the one who takes the place of all of those who put their trust in him. He went to a cross and he took him within his body, the sin of everybody who would put their trust in him. And then he bore the guilt of that sin. And because he bore that guilt, he then suffered the wrath of the father against all of that sin. And he satisfied that wrath so that those who actually put their trust in Christ could go free. That's how we want to remember Jesus this morning. The one who proved by his deeds, by his miracles, that his message was the true message and he was indeed the savior. So if you're here this morning and you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you have entrusted him with the matter of your sin before a holy God. Join us in taking the elements this morning. When they come to you, take them and hold them and remember who Christ is. Remember the things that he did that prove to you that he is the Messiah. That he is the one who came and suffered for your sin and that you are free from the penalty of your sin. And then when your heart is ready, take the elements on your own. If you're here today and you are not a believer, we want you to know something. That is that we're very, very thankful that you're here. Whether you are the youngest person in this room or you are the oldest person in this room, we are very thankful that you are here with us today. We want you to know and understand something. If you're not a follower of Christ, you really are discounting the irrefutable testimony of his words and his miracles. He put these miracles in front of us so that we would know that they are the truth. He performed those miracles so that you could know that you can have eternal life by putting your faith and your trust in him. So when the elements come to you, just pass them to the next person. But use this time well. Use this time to consider what he did right here on the pages of scripture, the testimony for you. After the service, there will be someone up here to my right, and they will be willing to talk to you. They'll be happy to open their Bibles and explain to you how you too can have a relationship with Christ. So men, come and serve us, and then I'll close our time in prayer.
To inform our time in prayer this morning, I'm going to read the first few verses of Psalm 65. There will be silence before you and praise in Zion, O God, and to you the vow will be performed. O you who hear prayer, to you all men come. Iniquities prevail against me, as for our transgression, you forgive them. How blessed is the one whom you choose and bring near to you to dwell in your courts. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your son. What a gift it is to be able to look back on the life of your son, to look back on the miracles that he performed, the miracles that authenticated him and his message, that he is the savior, that salvation is available through him, repentance and faith in him and his work in our place at the cross. Thank you for that, O Lord. What a kindness of you to give us your son as a savior. What a privilege it is to be in this church, to be in fellowship together as a body of Christ. Lord, what a privilege it is to love one another well, to be able to come alongside one another and assist one another and encourage one another. Lord, you bring circumstances into our lives that are challenging. Lord, there is loss of work. There is difficulty finding new work. Yet you give us one another to encourage us with truth. I pray this morning for all of those who are looking for work, those who are between jobs, Lord, those who have unique gifting and skills and abilities. Lord, I pray that you would be pleased to arrange for them work whereby they could put your gifting of them, their skills and abilities that you've given to them on display, and they could bring great glory to you by working for their means and their provision. Thank you, Lord, as well, that you've given us one another to encourage us in sickness. Lord, this church knows true sickness and it's deep sickness. Lord, I thank you for Garrett Butcher, that he attends our church. He's a part of this church. He comes and listens to the teaching and listens to the fellowship and is a part of it. Lord, as he has been hospitalized with appendicitis, I pray for him, Lord. I pray that during this time, he would know your nearness and your goodness. And he would know the fellowship of the body of Christ as members of this body of Christ and his small group come alongside him. Lord, I pray that he would be encouraged to persevere in the knowledge that you are good and trustworthy in all things. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us opportunities to fellowship with one another in small groups. Thank you, Lord, for the work that you do when people come together, that you sharpen one another and you encourage one another through the words and the deeds and the insights and the observations of others. I pray for our small groups this summer and through the remainder of this year, Lord, that we would be ones who enter into fellowship with one another well. Lord, that we encourage one another and that the body would grow through our involvement with one another in those small groups. And Lord, I pray for the women's retreat that is coming up in a few weeks. Lord, I thank you for the subject of hospitality. I thank you for the speaker, Jacob. Lord, I pray for the women and I pray for Jacob in advance that you would be preparing them to hear your perspective on how it is we can use the means that you've given to us to advance your kingdom. Thank you again for this service and the privilege that we have of worshiping and fellowshipping together. Oh God, we pray that you would be exalted in it. I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.